Well, hi there, folks. Alan Taylor here again with another session of the uh, Fireside Clinical Reasoning Sessions. This time we're going to be look at, looking at how um, clinicians can begin to differentiate between uh, sciatica or lumbar referred pain or radicular pain, whichever term you prefer to use, and vascular flow limitations, which are known to mimic um, those, that particular condition. So it's a bit of a tough one, but uh, hopefully this uh, short presentation will give you some ideas about how from just the subjective history alone, you can begin to uh, tackle this problem. What we know is that vascular flow limitations in the lower limb can occur for a range of different reasons. And one of them, of course, is peripheral arterial disease or atherosclerosis of the uh, vascular structures in the lower limb. And here's a nice diagram of atherosclerosis and what it looks like on the inside. And as you can see, the vessel doesn't look quite as healthy as it perhaps used to do. And we often see this in the older age groups uh, of, of patients who might present to us complaining of, of leg symptoms. But interestingly, it's not just the older age groups that suffer vascular issues. What uh, we've come to realise in more recent years is that vascular conditions can affect younger uh, elite athletes, in actual fact, uh, and there's a condition called endofibrosis, which can affect most commonly the iliac arteries and lead to um, lower limb uh, symptoms, which again can be mistaken and misdiagnosed as pain of lumbar referred origin. So how do we begin to make sense of this and how do we differentiate from the subjective history some of these complaints that patients talk to us about? The first thing we need to consider is the distribution of symptoms. Now, most commonly in vascular cases, the description by the patient will be that the pain is vague, affects the limb as a whole, it's difficult to differentiate, and it's certainly not following a dermatomal pattern. So that's the first thing that we need to consider. So these dermatomal patterns that we know about, um, if a patient is giving you a really nice description of uh, L5 or L4 or 3, uh, maybe you need to go and explore the neurological, but if they're giving you a sort of vague pattern, um, then maybe there's a consideration of a vascular ischemic cause for their pain. And that's, that, that's one of the key differentiators. And this is most certainly not a dermatomal pattern, but it actually is an ischemic pattern. And as we come to learn more about the uh, sort of branches of the arteries that serve the lower limb, you'll be uh, able to identify which artery uh, actually would be responsible for that under exercise conditions. Again, you see a band of pain around the thigh in this case, and this can happen in the upper limb, we know as well, uh, where vascular conditions are often reported as bands of pain, which is an unusual descriptor for patients. So if you hear that, again, it doesn't fit that classic dermatomal pattern. And as we get to know more about the vascular system, we realize um, why some of those pain patterns might occur. Uh, and then sometimes you could see a sort of sock distribution like this, which again is, is really not dermatomal. And, and once again, there will be a particular artery that might be involved in producing that um, sort of pain pattern. And we know that this is commonly uh, misdiagnosed as compartment syndrome in the first instance. It could be mistaken for a sciatica, but frankly, it doesn't have all the hallmarks of a, of a classical sciatic pattern. Uh, and I think you'll probably agree that seeing a patient with this sort of distribution makes you kind of think maybe there could be a, a lumbar issue going on. Uh, and you can have this particular patient with or without the, the, the back or, or, or buttock symptoms and maybe perhaps just with the thigh uh, and um, distal calf symptoms with maybe some radiation into the foot, which is, is why people do commonly mistake this for uh, ridiculous problems. Uh, and some of these cases are quite complex. This this particular pain pattern uh, uh, was suffering, this, this patient was suffering low back pain, which was physiotherapy induced low back pain, which is an interesting story that I'll tell you about on another uh, visit. If it's not following a dermatomal pattern and you've got this really vague descriptor, uh, which is linked to the next two key things, then you might be perhaps raising your suspicion of a vascular issue. So that's the first thing, the dermatomal pattern. 
The next thing, which is key, is the behavior of the symptoms. The symptoms are not behaving in a mechanical way, they're behaving in an exercise-induced way. In other words, the patient does something, an exercise, walking, going up the stairs, doing something at the gym, riding a bicycle, whatever it might be, and the symptoms come on. And they get worse the more they do that, the higher the heart rate gets. And it's relieved by rest or reduction of that activity. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. So in the case of peripheral arterial disease, where you've got someone who suffers pain when walking, um, often they have to stop for that pain to ease off and it will ease off after a, a, few, a few minutes maybe. And then the patient can continue and then the pain might return again. And that's a, a typical atherosclerotic pattern in actual fact. And, and walking is the most common sort of activity that they relate that to. If you look though at these endofibrosis cases, which really are only known to occur in uh, elite sport, the symptoms come on, the athlete will describe when I make high level efforts. In other words, when my heart rate goes really high and all I have to do is ease off. I don't have to stop. I just have to slow down a little and my heart rate just has to lower a little. Um, and those symptoms will disappear. And in actual fact, I could probably ride all day at that lower heart rate, which is really interesting and illustrates the ischemic nature of this problem. The third thing is the associated symptoms. And this is one of the key things. The atherosclerotics will find that their walking distance is reduced and they've got the pain, so they complain of that. The athletes with the endofibrosis issues will complain of weakness or loss of power in the limb. And because they're athletes, that manifests itself as diminished performance. Uh, and that's something they're really concerned about because often these are elite athletes, professional athletes, and their um, living depends on being able to perform at a high level and having full power. So uh, having one leg that doesn't function perfectly is a key concern to them. So if they're describing any of those things, and this is not in a myotomal pattern, this is a general weakness of the limb. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about the lower limb, but that can occur in the upper limb as well. All right, so those are the three key things Things. So the summary for your vascular pattern recognition is, first of all, does it follow this dermatomal distribution or is it vague and is it affecting the whole of the limb in an unusual way? Uh, are the symptoms exercise induced? This is very different from mechanical. It's a very different thing. And are they eased by rest? And if so, at what level does the heart rate have to go to? And we can explore this more with the elite athletes, perhaps. And then above all, the associated symptoms which are often linked to weakness or descriptors by the patient of loss of power. So really, if you've got those three things combining together, you should have a higher index of suspicion of a vascular condition. Uh, and it's important that you then go on to do the correct physical examination uh, and make sense of these symptoms. Now, um, this all started back on a previous slide with the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which is one of the first articles I wrote on this particular topic. But uh, I've just been listening to this really uh, rather interesting um, podcast by Rob uh, Hinchliffe, who explains uh, how iliac artery endofibrosis develops in a, in a sports person and talks through some of the descriptions that I've just alluded to in this short presentation. So, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. You'll find me uh, lurking around on Twitter and elsewhere. And don't forget to go to Thinkific if you want some uh, further detail on clinical reasoning, particularly related to the cranial nerves. Thanks for listening, folks.